Will you please remain standing for our scripture reading this morning, which comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 35 through 41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. This morning, may you help me get out of the way so that you may speak through me, with me, beyond me, and in spite of me, if necessary. All glory and honor is yours now and forever. Amen. Something about me. I hate thunderstorms. Anytime severe weather comes around, I am like that little small dog in the corner shaking, and I am terrified and incredibly upset. And this all started when I was in the third grade. My class did a unit on weather, and I became enthralled with tornadoes. I was so fascinated by them, and I wanted to learn everything I could. So I read all sorts of books, specifically those National Geographic kids' books, where they talk about each like, phase of a storm that comes together to create the perfect storm that is a tornado. My favorite book was The Magic Tree House, Twister on a Tuesday. I loved the, the movie from the 90s, Twister. And I even had this little tube of water where you spun it and you created, created your own tornado. I felt like I knew everything there was to know about tornadoes, and I got all of this information just in time for a tornado to pass through my neighborhood in Cabot. We were incredibly lucky that my family's house did not have any damage, and we didn't know anybody that got hurt. But I was terrified, and from that day on, a fear of severe thunderstorms was born. After that first experience, every time we were under a tornado warning or even just a bad tornado watch, I would grab my favorite toy, the dog always, and some blankets and make a beeline to my parents' closet for shelter. My siblings would willingly come to the closet behind me with whatever they deemed to be their survival essentials and my mom in tow. My dad, on the other hand, did not take shelter so easily. Most of the times, whenever we had a tornado warning, my dad was at work, but the few times he was home, he would not go to the closet. Actually, I can only think of one time he actually took shelter with us, if even that. Most times when the tornado warnings rolled around and fear took over every decision I made, my dad was calm and collected as he headed outside to watch the sky, like most fathers during tornado season. <laughs> It always made me so mad when he did this. I was so scared and I could not possibly understand why he would not take this storm as seriously as I thought he should. I thought I knew everything there was to know about tornadoes and I definitely knew how dangerous they could be. So I could not understand why my dad would go outside and not take shelter. And while I do not condone his behavior to this day, what I didn't realize at the time is that my dad had his own knowledge. He knew that when the sky turned a certain shade of green or the air fell dangerously still, we were in trouble. My dad knew what to look for in the sky and until he saw those things, he knew not to worry. Even when it was time to be concerned, my dad would always remain calm, at least on the outside. I imagine that the fear and frustration I felt at my dad were similar to the feelings the disciples had to Jesus during the storm from our scripture. I mean, imagine it. You are in this huge thunderstorm and you're stuck at sea. And it's not just some small little pond. You're on the Sea of Galilee, water on all sides of you. The boat begins to take on water and you're a fisherman. So you know that if something doesn't change, the boat's gonna go down and you're going down with it and you're all gonna die. 
And the person who you've seen perform these miracles and helped all these people is asleep, doing nothing to help you survive. To be completely honest, if I were one of the disciples, I would have been mad as all get out at Jesus. And that's one of my favorite parts about the way the author of Mark tells this story. The author lets us feel that frustration. The story from our scripture today is not unique to Mark. It appears in each of what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Matthew and Luke, the disciples call out to Jesus with what I read as more reverence. In Matthew, the disciples say, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Or, yeah, in Matthew, the disciples say, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And in Luke, they declare, Master, Master, we're going to drown. But in Mark, the disciples behave a little differently. In Mark, the disciples question Jesus with frustration and desperation when they ask, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And I read that as, Teacher, Rabbi, Lord, friend, do you not care that we are about to die? Do you not see that we are suffering, that the plan has fallen to shambles, and you have the power to stop it, but you're doing nothing? Why are you asleep? Jesus, do you not care about us? The way Mark tells this story gives us permission to be scared. It gives us permission to question God, and it gives us, as disciples of Christ, permission to be frustrated. Mark teaches us that we are allowed to ask God the hard questions because God can take it. And this applies to more than just tornadoes and storms on the Sea of Galilee. We all have our metaphorical storms in life. And I do not know what you are individually going through, but I know we all have something or have had something. I know I have lived through things that have made me cry out to God asking, do you not care? Do you not see the pain I am experiencing and the hurt that is making me feel like I am drowning? Why do you do nothing? God, why are you asleep? But friends, I have some good news. You are not alone. God is with you. God does love you and God does care for you more than any of us can possibly fathom. You are seen and loved by the God who created all of the stars in the sky and who knows you so completely that they know every single hair on your head. You are allowed to be afraid and to cry out to God. And our faith ensures us that we are loved by a God who can calm the storm. Even when you cannot see it, God is with you, walking alongside you and guiding you. And when I say God can calm the storm, I don't mean everything's going to be fine and dandy, peachy keen, just the way you want it to be. Because we all know that's not true. But when I say God can calm the storm, I mean that God can calm the storm within us and grant us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Fear is normal and expected in the storms of our lives, but our faith in who Jesus is and who God is can calm our fears and grant us a beautiful, blessed assurance that makes absolutely no sense. Jesus asks the disciples why they are afraid and why they lack faith because he recognizes that they do not 100% trust who Jesus is. Or maybe he sees that they have allowed fear to cause them to forget who Jesus is. I don't know about y'all, but that happens to me a lot. When things are good, I can sing the song and pray, songs and pray the prayers with the best of them. But when things are bad, I can forget who God is. I can forget the promises that accompany Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And I think we can all forget to rest in the assurance of the fact that I am and you are all beloved children of God. When fear creeps in, we can forget who we are and whose we are. In those times, it is easy to feel like the ground has fallen out from under you and your reason and experience do not give the answers that you need. It is in those times that we can rely on scripture to be our guide, to remind us when we have forgotten just who God is and just who Jesus is. So let's go back to our scripture for today. The story in the Gospel of Mark is situated right after a period of Jesus' teaching. And while Jesus is teaching, there are these Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious leaders, who are kind of off to the side, saying, who is this man? Who gives him this authority? 
And to me, this story answers that question. Mark tells us, or shows us, instead of telling us, exactly who Jesus is. So when we find Jesus and the disciples in this fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, they were at the end of a long day where Jesus had been teaching and preaching using parables to these great large crowds. And Jesus said to the disciples, let's go across to the other side. And he took his small group of disciples with him onto the boat and they set out onto the water. Now something I have learned is that whenever there is water in a biblical story, we need to pay attention to it. Water is often connected to our understanding of God as creator, who has been at work in the world since the very beginning. You see, in Genesis, at the very beginning, we are told that the earth was chaos and darkness swept over the earth. And something that's important to know is that in the ancient world, water and chaos went hand in hand. They were used almost interchangeably because water, while it was a source of life, was also a source of death. If water did or did not come, determined people's survival. The strength of water as it ran through the rivers and the seas determined people's survival. And water was also out of people's control. We don't get to control what the water does. So water is essentially the same thing as chaos in the minds of an ancient reader. So in the creation story, in the midst of this chaos that is the earth before the earth, The breath of God swept over the water, the chaos. And in the second day of the creation story, God separates the waters of the universe into the sky and sea, giving each of these waters areas that it could or could not go into, setting parameters. And in order to understand the significance and the power behind this separation, we need a little bit more context about the earliest receivers of this story. Many biblical scholars believe that the compilation of the Bible started around the time of what we call the Babylonian captivity. While these stories we know were definitely around long before then, the Babylonian captivity during which the Israelites were taken from their home and forced to live in Babylon under Babylonian occupation with their homes destroyed, their temple destroyed, their family and friends scattered, This was the occasion during which a lot of the Hebrew Bible was written down for the first time by the Israelite priests. So the Israelite priests are writing these stories for a people in a foreign land who are at risk of losing their identity, who are forgetting who they are and whose they are. In fact, the Babylonians were helping them to forget. The Israelite people were being fed another story, a Babylonian story, about the creation of the world and the supposed gods that had built it. You see, the Babylonians told a story of creation that was fraught with violence and destruction and death. They had this goddess of the sea and the ultimate depiction of chaos named Tiamat. And this council of Babylonian gods feared her power and her chaos, so they sent their supreme god to battle it out with Tiamat. And the Babylonians believed that in order for creation to occur, their supreme god had to defeat the goddess of sea and chaos. So their supreme god battled Tiamat and destroyed her. And with her body, he separated it and created the sea of the sky and the sea of the earth. This was the story the Babylonians were spreading to the Israelites in captivity. A story of violence and destruction and death. The Israelite priests saw the tale that the Babylonians were selling, and they knew they had to remind God's people of their identity and the God that they serve. So the priests wrote down our creation story. Our creation story where God reigns over chaos, and chaos obeys the God of the universe. Our creation story where God does not fear the destructive force of chaos, but calls it good at the end of the second day. The Israelite priests declared to a people in captivity that their God, their Adonai, their rock and redeemer was more powerful than the gods of Babylon, that their God was more truer than the gods of their oppressor. Because Yahweh did not need to create the world through death and violence. Yahweh did not need to destroy chaos because chaos bows to the one true God. Instead, God treated the source of life and death, the ultimate portrayal of chaos and unruliness, like a toddler, 
giving it parameters where it can and cannot go, like a child in a playpen. That was the message the Israelite priest had for their people during the Babylonian captivity. And that is the message I have for you today. I do not know what is holding you captive. I do not know what chaos is ruling your life, what lies you are being told, or what storms are sinking your boat. But I know for certain that God is bigger. God is bigger than the chaos of this world and God is brighter than the darkness. And in fact, God has been ordering the chaos since the dawn of creation. That is also why Jesus slept on the boat. When the Son of God was brought face to face once again with the ultimate representation of chaos and destruction, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew the power within him and that resides in each of us. And he was not driven by fear. Jesus knew that the wind and the sea, the chaos, would bow to him, the Son of the Creator. So when Jesus asked the disciples, have you still no faith? He was also asking them, do you still not know, not trust who I am? Do you not believe what I tell you to be true? Do you not believe that I am the Messiah, the only son of the God who calms the chaos? You see, faith and trust go hand in hand because when we trust that Jesus is Lord, we have faith that he does care. We have faith that he can and will calm the storms. And we believe that his life, death, and resurrection have destroyed the powers of sin and evil and death once and for all. On the other hand, a lack of faith coincides with the question the disciples asked at the end of our story. Who is this man? And I don't say a lack of faith with condemnation or judgment. But when our faith is not steady, we can forget who Jesus is. And when we forget who Jesus is, we forget who we are. We forget that we are all God's beloved children. And it is in our faith that we stand firm in the knowledge of our identity as beloved children of God. But like I said earlier, there are times where our faith may be lacking through the storms of life. And I do not in any way say that to mean that you are in any way lacking. But instead, I say that to recognize that we are all human and we all mess up and we all get it wrong. Luckily, as a community of faith, we have practices to hold us and to help us remember who we are always. Namely, we have baptism. When a person is baptized into the church, we are claiming for them and with them what has always been true, that they are a child of God. Recently, Bishop Merrill, the bishop of the Arkansas Conference, said during a baptismal ceremony that every time we see water, we are meant to be reminded of our baptism. So every time you see water, when you're washing your hands, when you're drinking water, when you're jumping into a pool, we are meant to be reminded of the day we joined the holy fellowship of the body of Christ, of the day we claimed our place or were claimed for us our place as a child of God. When we remember our baptism, we are meant to remember who we are and whose we are so that we may stand firm in that knowledge of our identity during the storms of life with a peace that surpasses all understanding. So in a little bit, when we prepare to leave, you'll see some bowls of water at the exits. You are invited to place your hand in the water, splash it, pick it up, drop it, whatever, don't drink it, but do whatever you want with the water and remember your baptism. Remember the fact that you are a child of the God who has been ordering chaos and calming the storms from the dawn of creation. And when you forget, remember, that is who you are always. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, our rock and redeemer, though we cannot entirely understand it, we know that you order the chaos and that you are always with us, loving and guiding us. Thank you for being the voice who cries out in the storm, be silent, be still. Help us to hear that command, to rest in the assurance that you are God and we are not. Help us to yield control to you and to trust that you are who you say you are and we are who you say we are. We ask these things in the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.